in the pursuit of truth, Dali, Chapter One, Home, Part One. China's 1954 Constitution: Citizens of China enjoy freedom of residence. The homes of citizens are inviolable. In the western district of Shanghai, only a stone's throw away from the present United States consulate, stands a western-style multi-story apartment building. In the midst of the skyscrapers erected during the construction boom at the turn of the millennium, this building hardly attracts any attention. It was once, however, the tallest in the district within the radius of a few kilometers. It was a frigid winter day of early 1968. And the northwest wind was howling. Dr. left work and rode his bike to a wharf on the east side of the Huangpu River. There were no bridges then. A tunnel nearby was not open for public use. Two green plastic tokens, at a cost of about a bowl of noodle soup, were the pass to get on the ferry. With his old clunker, Dr. took off his gloves, lit a cigarette, and was lost in thought. Mother called, and the message was brief. They came. This was the third year of the so-called Cultural Revolution. On the surface, the climax of chaos and anarchy. Created by the Red Guards in the fall of 1966, had passed, but a deeper, systematic, and sustained political campaign of class cleansing to target the rank and file had just started. What happened this time? The cigarette burned to its end as the ferry's port side bent against a giant used truck tire hanging at the side of the dock. The ferry door slid open. Passengers swarmed out. Bikers took the lead, and the bells rang as the stream of the two-wheel vehicles dashed to the main street. It was the usual thirty-minute ride home, the road he had traveled every working day. But this time, for Dr., he looked awfully long. Dr. carried the bike several steps up to the platform in front of the glass gate, and then rode it into the hallway flanked by the giant mirrors on both sides. He could not help but look at the left mirror and wondered what was waiting ahead for the guy he saw over there. He greeted the elevator operator and positioned his bike diagonally so it would fit in. With a ding dong, the elevator door opened, and he was outside his home unit. Dr. unlocked the door. Nobody was home. He saw on the right side of the corridor that the two rooms facing north were closed. On the vertical split glass door were two large-sized paper strips forming a cross. On the strips were Chinese characters meaning "seal," written by a brush pen, along with the date. And the name of the revolutionary committee of the hospital where his father was employed. This was what mother meant by saying, "They came. They were the rebels in father's hospital, and they had taken further revolutionary actions—a euphemism for a home raid." A man labeled as reactionary academic authority, and once employed by a hospital run by the old nationalist government, such as D.R.'s father, simply could not be allowed 
to continue to occupy the 100 square meter four room apartment. The ceiling of the closed doors seemed to have been done haphazardly, and a part of those strips were already hanging loose. DR examined them carefully, and it turned out that not enough adhesive was applied, but the seals, tight or loose, meant that the family could no longer use the space left behind. DR was not really surprised at what just happened. This was a continuation of the lawlessness starting at outbreak of the Cultural Revolution in 1966, two years earlier, when millions of homes were searched, personal properties were confiscated or destroyed, all under the banner of fighting the so-called Four O's, a political jargon during the Cultural Revolution meaning old ideas, old culture, old customs, and old habits. That was also the first time the revolutionaries from the hospital arrived to search the home. They were made of janitors, clerks, and some junior doctors, and led by party carders. As compared to the barbaric young Red Guards, those revolutionaries from the hospital still kept some civility in that at least they refrained from doing physical harm to their political targets. They nevertheless took away the books of classic Chinese literature and the records of Western classical music. Besides, they complained about not being able to find gold in the apartment. Diar's father explained that for decades he was basically a salary earner. He pointed to his mouth and said, the only gold from a couple of old rings was used for my false teeth right here. His revolutionary colleagues did not further press because they knew it was true. Then came a relatively quiet period of time for DR's father as he was relieved from all the administrative duties, he was able to focus on daily patient care. The family prayed that would be the end of the turmoil, but the pause was not meant to be the end. Now, two years later, it was deja vu all over again. The hysteria in the name of the revolution did not subside. Instead, it resurged to a new height. Could DR's parents survive this again? Would the hospital authority let them remain in the two unsealed rooms? And if so, for how long? Would having the living space cut in half be enough of a punishment already? DR's parents had no illusions that they could go unscathed at this new juncture, but they were still holding on to the sliver of hope that things would not further deteriorate from here. One month later, however, the order came that the family had to evacuate the whole apartment. Out they went. A small unit on the third floor in a dilapidated building nearby was assigned to them. A room less than 20 square meters served as bedroom, living room, and study combined. Attached to it was a dingy bathroom with a gas range installed next to the tub, so it would also be used as the kitchen. DR's parents appealed for a little extra space for the grown-up son, and were lucky to be allowed to use a six-square-meter den on the second floor. DR put in a small folding bed alongside the wall at the end of the den. On the right side was the wardrobe with the sofa 
on top of it. On the left, a chest of drawers was placed against the tiny window, partially blocking its view. He squeezed in a square table between the cabinet and the wardrobe, with only a narrow passage left between the bed and the door, through which he had to move in and out sideways like a crawling crab. Dior lay down on his squeaking bed, gave an extended exhalation, and felt somewhat relieved. The constant pressure to downsize had lingered on for almost two years, and everyone knew the status quo could not last after all. Sometimes the uncertainty was worse than the outcome. Was this the living condition he would settle down with at least for the foreseeable future? It was amazing how people's expectations could be adapted to reality. This was a moment to reflect. What was DR's reflection? Stay tuned for the next episode.